Uh, Guildhall is uh, one of the wonders of London, uh, so by definition, it's one of the wonders of the world. And it's one of the greatest privileges of my life to be speaking here this evening. My gratitude to Sir Mark Boliat and his fellow chairs of the City's Policy and Resources Committee over the past 20 years extends to much more than hosting this event. Since the launch of the Academy's programme 17 years ago, the City and its livery companies have played a vital role in the Renaissance of London State Schools. Judith Mayhew Jonas was the first leader of a London enterprise to commit to establishing an academy, now the fantastic City of London Academy in Southwark. And I vividly recall the meeting in the State Dining Room of 10 Downing Street where we sealed the deal. I deliberately held the meeting in Sir John Soane's great dining room because it's the only venue in number 10 which is a match for this guild hall and the Lord Mayor's magnificent mansion house. More than 30 academies have been established by the corporation and delivery companies and they have reinvented the city's social mission. The city corporation also does a brilliant job maintaining the second and third greatest city parks in the world. Hampstead Heath and Epping Forest. The greatest, of course, is Regent's Park and its Rose Garden. Then there's the city's contribution to the arts and culture, particularly the Barbican Centre and the Museum of London, which will become greater still when the new museum and concert hall are built. And Sir Mark is in the market for anyone with a cheque for about £300 million to help with uh, that enterprise. I also pay tribute to the city as a champion of Crossrail and transport infrastructure London-wide, and for your generous support for King's College London's Commission on London, which I chair. Our director is Tony Halmos, a dedicated servant of the Corporation and of London over many decades. Can I particularly highlight your role as a conscientious and quality provider of social housing? We need far more of it, and if I can abuse my hospitality, can I suggest the next social mission for the Corporation? that you set a target for doubling the corporation's stock of social housing in the next decade, that is 5,000 new homes, to make a difference and to show leadership in the face of London's greatest crisis, the shortage of affordable housing. I can't think of any greater work you could do, and you are brilliantly equipped to do it. King's College at London is another powerful force for social and civic progress in this city, and it is a high honour that King's has invited me to be a visiting professor and to deliver this inaugural lecture. Ed Byrne leads King's College with distinction and is worth every penny. I, <laughs> I uh, much enjoy being part of the Strand Group under its highly entrepreneurial leader, John Davis. John's team, including the evergreen John Rental, are building a British version of the Kennedy School of Government on the banks of the Thames, and it is a worthy match. I particularly thank Martin Stolliday, today's organiser-in-chief, and Jack Brown, who helped me with my research. <laughs> uh, there's a great fan club at the back. My most useful research was reading Jack's PhD on the transformation of Canary Wharf from Wasteland to a vast networked extension of the City of London in just 15 years. And the prime mover was Michael Heseltine, a great practical visionary who I am proud to call a mentor. Let me start by transporting you to another great global city. In the last days of Pope Eugenius IV in the 15th century, two of his servants, the learned Pogius and a friend, ascended the Capitoline Hill, reposed themselves among the ruins of columns and temples, and viewed from that commanding spot the prospects of desolation. The place and the objects gave ample scope for moralizing on the vicissitudes of fortune, which spares neither man nor the proudest of his works, and which buries empires and cities in a common grave. The hill of the capital on which we sit, wrote Pogius, was formerly the head of the Roman Empire, the citadel of the earth, the terror of kings. This spectacle of the world, how it is fallen, how changed, how defaced, 
The path of victory is obliterated by vines and the benches of the senators concealed by a dunghill. Cast your eyes on the Palatine Hill and seek among the shapeless and enormous fragments, the marble theater, the obelisks, the colossal statues, the porticos of Nero's palace, the forum of the Roman people where they assembled to enact their laws and elect their magistrates is now enclosed for the cultivation of pot herbs and thrown open for the reception of swine and buffaloes. The public and private edifices that were founded for eternity lie prostrate, naked and broken, like the limbs of a mighty giant. And the ruin is the more visible from the stupendous relics that have survived the injuries of time and fortune. That was Edward Gibbon writing 240 years ago about Rome, tragic and broken, nearly a millennium after the destruction of its empire. Even today, a century and a half after the Risorgimento, Rome remains the limbs of a mighty giant, stupendous relics that have survived the injuries of time and fortune. Even within Italy, Milan has an economy twice the size of Rome's and is a st stronger magnet for everything except classical remains and Catholicism. And the universal church is not what it was either, no doubt to Gibbon's posthumous approval, since he saw Christianity as the most insidious force enfeebling Rome. I love Gibbon's verdict on monasticism, painful to the individual and useless to mankind. It is precisely my view of Brexit. <laughs> so London beware, great cities, capitals of Europe, no less, rise and fall. Let our grandchildren not wander around Parliament Square amid swine and buffaloes, or to Canary Wharf overtaken by vines and pot herbs. Let this great Guild Hall not become an architectural graveyard like the Roman Forum, while Parisians admire Nelson's column re-erected next to the Arc de Triomphe. By my estimation, London is the 10th capital of Europe since Athens. Only one of the other nine, Paris, remains a great city. Venice is a great museum, partially submerged. Istanbul is becoming a great prison. The other former citadels, citadels of the earth are now mostly stupendous relics. Cordova was Europe's foremost city in the 11th century. Palermo overtook it a century later when London was barely a large town. Granada assumed the mantle in the 14th century, soon overtaken by Paris. In 1500, Paris was five times larger than London. The capital of England, an England then beset by civil and religious wars, was on a par with Bordeaux, Lyon, Marseille, and nine Italian cities. The stability and toleration of the long and wise reign of Elizabeth I turned London into one of Europe's great commercial cities. The civil wars and unwisdom of Charles I and James II turned the clock back in the next two generations, and it took the long-run stability and liberalism after the glorious revolution of 1688 for Britain and its capital city to really flourish. Only for the last 150 years has London clearly outshone Paris, thanks to an era of French revolutions, military defeats, and decadence, which took the Versailles of Louis XIV to the calamities of Verdun and Vichy. I say all this because Britain and London are at one of those critical moments when it could all start to go wrong. Rome, Athens, Constantinople, Venice, Paris, Cordova, Granada, Palermo, Amsterdam, all depended on the vitality of their national and international settings. The fate of Rome was sealed by the Goths, Goths and Vandals. Constantinople was doomed when the Ottomans overran Byzantium. Also, the walls of Constantinople were breached by gunpowder because, Louis the, uh, because Constantine XI had failed to modernize his city's infrastructure. Trade is crucial. Venice, already in decline, could not survive the commercialization of the Cape route from Europe to the Indian Ocean. And cultural and inter intellectual vitality is equally essential. 
as Roy Jenkins used constantly to remind me. Salamanca was Europe's greatest university in the Middle Ages. The Counter-Reformation turned it into a branch of the Inquisition, while the Reformation and constitutional government propelled Oxford and Cambridge, scholastic extensions of London, to the greatest heights. Simply because London is capital of Europe now does not mean it will remain so. Only wise policy and leadership will keep it there. Consider for a moment what has made London so great. Political stability and military security unmatched by any nation in Europe, indeed probably the world, for 330 years since 1688. Huge and generally secure international trade, also since the late 17th century, first by British naval dominance in the British Empire, and more recently safeguarded by the European Union and a benign international regime for trade. When the French captured Amsterdam in 1795, much of the city's wealth fled across the Channel to London, as it did from Antwerp during the Napoleonic Wars, and from Paris itself and other cities of continental Europe during the ceaseless wars and revolutions of the 19th and 20th centuries. With trade, pros pros prosperity, and toleration came people, Chinese, Irish, French, Germans, Jews, Africans, Af Afro-Caribbeans, Cypriots even, and uh, latterly Poles and Central and East Europeans. Merchants, refugees, intellectuals, economic migrants, the super rich, bearings from Northern Germany, Rothschilds from Frankfurt, Casinos from Huguenot France, but also the poor just about able to pay their passage. Like my dad, who in 1959 came by boat and train from Famagusta via Venice, aged 18, ending up in Mornington Crescent. London's population grew from 1 million in the 19th century to 7 million by the end of the century on the back of transformed infrastructure, railways, parks, schools, roads, housing, hospitals, public buildings, bridges, and perhaps most important of all, Sir Joseph Bazalgette's amazing sewers, which abolished cholera in the 1850s and provided London with sanitation matched by a few other cities at home or abroad. In 1800, Greater London made up about 12% of the population of England and Wales. By 1900, it was 20%. London's economy has always been broad and deep, with extraordinarily successful what I call brain service specialisms. Financial services didn't spontaneously ignite with the Big Bang. Lloyd's of London was founded in 1686, the Bank of England in 1694, the modern London Stock Exchange in 1801. In 1900, more than half of the world's trade was financed in sterling, half of the world's shipping tonnage was British, and more than half the stocks quoted on the Stock Exchange were overseas securities. Then there's London's excellent university system, the Benthamite UCL established in 1826, King's as a gesture of semi-friendly Anglican retaliation in 1829, the University of London in 1836, Imperial College and the Great South Ken Museums, which were all legacies of the Great Exhibition of 1851, and the LSC in 1895. Together with Oxford and Cambridge, this established a golden triangle of internationally unrivaled universities in terms of both quality and proximity. And to make all this possible, a national government based in London, which became a byword for uncorrupt and fairly efficient administration, and a London government, including this city corporation, which did an increasingly efficient job, however quaint its ceremonies, providing the services and institutions for a world city. The Metropolitan Board of Works was set up in 1855, the London County Council in 1889, the London Boroughs in 1899, the London Passenger Transport Board in 1933, the Greater London Council and the New Boroughs in 1965. And so again in our generation, the post-war decades were not great for London, partly because they were not great for Britain, austerity, acute industrial unrest in the 70s and 80s, and a country which had lost an empire but not found a role. The 40 years since the 1980s were particularly bad for London because of the mistaken policy of industrial relocation, a policy of deliberately trying to move jobs, businesses, 
indeed whole industries out of the capital because it was supposedly overheated and seeking to locate them instead in the Midlands and the North. The 1966 Selective Employment Tax introduced a levy on service jobs, which of course were disproportionately in London and the South, intended to subsidise manufacturing jobs, which were assumed by Howard Wilson's government to be the forte of the Midlands, the North and Scotland. The London Government Act of 1963 went so far as to make it illegal for the, L, for the GLC to advertise industrial opportunities in London. This, by the way, is one of the most amazingly discriminatory British legis legislative provisions I've ever come across. The 1963 Act said, and I quote, nothing shall authorise the Greater London Council to give publicity in the United Kingdom, whether by advertising or otherwise, to the commercial and industrial advantages of Greater London, and nothing shall authorise the publication of any advertisement or the establishment or maintenance of office accommodation by the Greater London Council in any place outside the United Kingdom. A quite amazing statutory provision. But what was the effect? London's population fell sharply, unemployment rocketed, public services decayed, and the London underground in the 1970s looked as if, as if it had witnessed the fall of Rome. Swathes of inner London became ghettos of poverty, crime, and hopelessness. But the same happened in the cities of the Midlands and the North too, except that they got it even worse. The population of Liverpool halved, halved, in the 60 years after 1937. What we learned then was that less London does not mean more Liverpool or any other city well beyond London. The prosperity of the North is not founded on the suppression of the South. On the contrary, the prosperity of London breeds the prosperity of Liverpool. And I've got a lot more to say about this in a moment. However, that was the dismal 1970s which I remember vividly growing up on a deplorable Camden council estate, regarding with awe and wonder the city corporation's much better estate at the end of the road, which is why, Mark, you should build so many more of them. <laughs> the policy of decongestion came to an end in the 1980s. So did the decline of Britain after the UK's highly successful membership of the European community after 1973, especially with the development of the single market by Margaret Thatcher, which was of especial benefit to London because of its strong services. Hence the transformation of the city of London and the creation of Docklands as a new city, complete with its own light railway, tube, and even airports. And forget not the National Lottery, a great innovation of John Majors, which transformed London's cultural institutions. Tate Modern was founded in the formerly derelict South Bank Power Station in 2000, thanks to the lottery, and it is now among the most visited and influential museums on the globe. Since the 1980s, London's population has risen 2 million to 8.6 million, matching its peak on the eve of the Second World War. But its economic region, stretching far beyond the boundaries of Greater London and the M25, to Oxford, Cambridge, Brighton, Reading, Bedford, Ipswich, and the new city of Milton Keynes, is larger and stronger than it has ever been. So too, London's international connectivity, not least because of Heathrow, the most successful airport in the history of aviation. All this has sustained unprecedented depth and breadth of trade, employment and higher education, London's universities being a jewel in its crown. The creation of the Mayoralty of London in 2000 was amongst the most inspired acts of the Blair government, and of course uh, there were many others. <laughs> Crossrail, the 2012 Olympics, the extension and upgrading of tube, bus and cycle networks, the shards and other tall buildings which beautify the London skyline as much as St Paul's, Big Ben and St Pancras, all the work of three bold mayors, Ken, Boris and Sadiq. Gladstone, the greatest peacetime Prime Minister of Britain and in many ways the creator of the prosperity and successful liberalism of Victorian, Victorian Britain, said... My first principle of foreign policy is good government at home. As we face Brexit, Gladstone's words cannot be repeated too often. The first principle of any sensible foreign policy should be good government at home. Now, in the wake of Brexit and the collapse of 50 years of Britain, British foreign and trade policy, the whole strategic direction of Britain's international and trade direction needs to be resolved. 
Just as Harold Macmillan had to reinvent Britain's foreign and European policy in the ruins of Suez, and did so with courage and fair success, we now need a political leader, hopefully of vision and competence, to do the same again. My own view is that the wisest leadership is to stop the whole Brexit fiasco and to tell the British people straight that on June the 23rd, 2016, they were sold a pup by political fraudsters, that that was a vote which could and should be reversed for the good of them, their children and their grandchildren, and that, does, and that as David Davis so wisely put it, a democracy which cannot change its mind is not a democracy. The truth is this, modern Britain can't have greater prosperity by su succumbing to a nationalist fever and pretending that we can leave our continent of Europe in terms of trade, security, and the intense multilateral cooperation needed to deal with the world's ever-present madmen and dictators. There is no such thing for modern Britain as splendid isolation. Actually, there wasn't in the past either, which is why even when Britannia ruled the waves and an empire on which the sun never set, we still got sucked into European conflagrations in 1914 and 1939. These days, of course, we don't even have an empire. As for the Royal Navy, it now has more admirals than ships and aircraft carriers with no aircraft. Without European peace, security and trade, we are in serious jeopardy as a country. So the sooner we stop this national self-mutilation, the better. However, whatever happens on Brexit, and I think you've got the gist of my views on that subject, <laughs> the future will be bleak without good government at home. This evening, I want to offer a big, bold Gladstonian prospectus for what we should do to tackle two of the biggest challenges facing the country, the North-South divide, and ensuring that London's future development is much more securely linked into the development and success of the great cities of the North and the Midlands, Birmingham, Coventry, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Nottingham, Derby, Newcastle, Hull, than it has been in the past, and without which the prosperity of London, as well as the rest of England, will be stunted. This is an, an inaugural lecture, so I need a commercial break to highlight two pieces of theory which underpin the plan I'm about to set out, what I'm going to call the golden arrow. I promise uh, that, that these pieces of theory are brief and hopefully interesting. Uh, first, there is Marchetti's constant, which suggests that throughout history, and regardless of changes in urban planning and transport technology, the average worker spends an hour commuting each day. The rule states that ever since Neolithic times, people tend to adjust their behaviors, including where they live, to keep a rough commute time of 30 minutes to and from work. The center of any city or village is therefore the point where most people living within it can reach in approximately 30 minutes, and most car and rail commutes are of, are of a similar duration. Pompeii, another stupendous Roman relic, bears this out for classical times in terms of both its layout and its road plan. Yakov Suhavi, a transport engineer with whom Cesare Marchetti worked, made a, made a related argument that people have a constant travel time budget which they allocate to commuting. In other words, better transport infrastructure doesn't cut travel times, rather it enables people to commute from farther afield, which may or may not be a good thing, but certainly is when they are commuting to such economic powerhouses as central London and central Manchester. By the way, when people say that commuting is bad or that commuter towns are boring, I haven't met many people in St Albans, Guildford, Brighton, Oxford and Cambridge, the last three of which are considerably more than 30 minutes out of London, saying that they wish they lived, lived instead in Blackpool or Burnley, or that they could get equivalent jobs there. Because London is so strong an economy, and its hinterland is so magnificent in terms of desirable places to live, I introduce you to the Adonis constant. This is that in respect of London, there is a readiness to commute up to three hours a day, not one hour, an hour and a half each way, provided that all told quality of life is good enough. That is, whatever the trade-off between housing, costs and amenities that works for each individual and their family. This links directly to my second piece of theory, 
the insight of Professor Henry Overman of the London School of Economics, that great cities are powerful locations both of production and of consumption. That is, they are not only places with um, uh, good enough jobs that produce things, they are also places where people want to live because they offer good quality of life. Not just enough jobs or the potential to commute towards good enough jobs within the Marchetti constant, but also good housing, schools, green and pleasant places, sports, the arts, all that with our differing eyes and requirements we regard as the good life. This insight is important because though it is undoubtedly true that most of the cities of the Midlands and the North have had an economically hard time of the last two generations, in Professor Henry Overman's language, they haven't done well as centers of production. They are mostly nonetheless still excellent, indeed, in many cases, outstanding centers of consumption. In particular, they have large stocks of good quality, spacious housing, a fraction of the cost of London's. They have excellent civic amenities, built by the same Victorians who endowed London so phenomenally. And they have proximity to many of the most beautiful places in England, some of them almost as beautiful as Regent's Park, like the Peak District, the Lake District, and the Yorkshire Dales. I want now to put together the following 12 pieces of my jigsaw, the Overman Insight, the Marchetti Constant, the Adonis Constant, HS2, Crossrail 2, Turning South London Orange, a third runway at Heathrow, Crossrail of the North, UK Central, the Midlands Hub, the Midlands Metro, and the Leeds Metro. And for those of you who aren't so initiated into the uh, mysteries of the most important infrastructure projects facing the country, uh, let me just say a word about each of them. The HS2 is the new high-speed line going from London to Birmingham, which is construction of which is starting next year, which then will be completed through to Manchester going northwest and Lull and, and Leeds going northeast at a date yet to be determined. Uh, Crossrail 2 is the proposed new north-south line in London, underground between Wimbledon and Seven Sisters, that will link Seven Sisters with King's Cross St Pancras, Euston, where HS2 will terminate, Tottenham Court Road, Victoria, Clapham Junction, which at long last will get a tube connection, and Wimbledon, where it will uh, act as an interchange with a lot of the commuter lines currently going into Waterloo, which is the single busiest station in the whole of Europe, more than 100 million passengers uh, this year, and one, I think, the second busiest station in the world, and that will then continue out into the southwest, taking over the commuter lines uh, down into southwest London. Um, um, Turning South London Orange is the idea for extending the high-frequency London Overground to include all of South London's heavy rail commuter lines so that they get much more frequent services and transformed quality of service too and also see their stations looking like civilised places for human beings to congregate. Uh, the Crossrail of the North is a new high-speed line linking Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Hull, York and then on to Hull and northeast onto uh, Newcastle. The Midlands Hub is a new high frequency connectivity from the new high speed station at Birmingham International, which is going to be, indeed I've suggested to the mayor of, um, of the West Midlands that he might call it UK Central, because it will be right in the center of the country and will combine the current Birmingham International Station, the High Speed 2 Station at Birmingham International, the National Exhibition Center, which is the largest exhibition space in the entire country, which is also uh, at Birmingham International, and Birmingham Airport, the plan for which is actually to relocate the terminal buildings on top of the HS2 station so that they become one single uh, entity. So there will be a phenomenal transport interchange next to two motorways, on the edge of Birmingham and a few miles from Solihull. And the plan which I strongly support that the mayor is developing is to have that net networked by trams and high-speed dedicated bus lanes through to Coventry and all of the other major towns and cities of the West Midlands. The Midlands Metro is uh, the plan to extend the new Birmingham tram to serve its wider conurbation. When you arrive at Birmingham New Street Station now, you'll see the new tram which has just opened. It's the first tram that, that Birmingham has had for 50 years. The Leeds Metro is the idea which I think has a huge amount of potential in it to connect Leeds and Bradford by a tram, transforming the connectivity between those two cities, which are only six minutes apart, but require an irregular 20-minute 20, 20 train journey to get to them between them at present. Now, if you put these 
12 pieces of jigsaw together in the right order, you get what I call the golden arrow. And let me explain. HS2, actually, let me first of all show you the golden arrow. This is the golden arrow. Uh, let me explain it. HS2, the new high-speed line from London to the Midlands of the North, goes London, Old Oak Common, a uh, interchange with Crossrail, which is just west of uh, Euston, uh, interchanges with Crossrail so that you can come down from Birmingham um, International, or UK Central as I hope it will be called, in 29 minutes, get straight onto Crossrail, 10 minutes into the West End, stops at Bond Street and Tottenham Court Road, 15 minutes into Farringdon and the city, and 20 minutes to Canary Wharf. And it's always important and crucial in understanding how transport systems work that there's connectivity between complementary transport systems, which because our transport systems were largely built by the Victorians and never were intended to connect, on the contrary, they were built by rival private companies who had every intention that they shouldn't connect because they didn't want to lose passengers, which is why the uh, Birmingham, for instance, which is the second largest city in the country, is essentially on the end of a branch line of the West Coast Main Line. It doesn't connect at all easily with Manchester and the Northwest, let alone the East Midlands and the Northeast. The connection, though, with HS2 at Old Oak Common, uh, which I think, by the way, should be renamed Brunel Interchange, because Old Oak Common doesn't mean anything to anybody, but the greatest engineer in Victorian Britain, I think, deserves to have a station named after him, which goes uh, through which the Great Western Railway actually goes. So that would be very fitting. But coming from Birmingham and HS2, changing at Old Oak uh, Common will enable you to get from Birmingham into the city or the West End in an hour from station to station right through. Whereas at the moment, it's an hour and 25 minutes from Birmingham to Euston, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to get from Euston to the Victoria and Northern Line platforms, or possibly an hour at the morning peak, because they often close the platforms because they're so congested. And then, of course, you've got a long and complicated journey going on from there. Um, Oxford is the part on the newly, um, newly electrified Great Western Railway and also has a second um, access to it now from London Marylebone, which opened two years ago, and I was very proud when I was Transport Secretary to give the funding for that. So it has transformed connectivity between London and Oxford, which is a hugely important uh, economic artery in the country. And then the plan is for the high-speed line to go up to Manchester with a branch off to Liverpool. Um, the east, the crossrail of the north, which I mentioned a moment ago, is the line that goes from Liverpool to Manchester to Leeds. Then the high-speed line comes down to Birmingham with connectivity through to, um, to Cambridge via the East Coast main line with a station at Peterborough, which goes across to Cambridge, and then down to London. And the crucial thing about this, if you look at it as a whole, and this is the, the crucial breakthrough piece of transport and social planning that we can engage in the next generation is that all of those destinations, all of them, with the exception of Leeds to Cambridge, which involves changing, all of them are within an hour of each other. Whereas at the moment, anything north of Oxford and Cambridge is substantially more than an hour going north. So it is going to be transformed connectivity. And if you apply the Adonis constant you will see that the potential to create this as a single integrated metro economic area in the next generation is huge. And it's not just the connectivity and the times which make this possible. HS2 trebles transport capacity between London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds. It trebles it whilst also massively improving reliability because this will be a, a high-speed line built to 21st um, century uh, standards as opposed to the current Victorian railway, or as I like to say, in the case of the London and Birmingham railway, that is the railway linking the two most important metropolises in the country, a pre-Victorian railway, because the London and Birmingham railway was built to be opened for the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1838. Indeed, it transported the crowds down there. So this is uh, the Golden Arrow, but the proviso is that for the Golden Arrow to work in terms of liberating and uh, dramatically enhancing economic activity within each of the metropolitan areas, it requires transformed connectivity not only between the cities, but also from each of the HS2 stations. If you get to Euston and can't get to the underground because it's congested and can't get anywhere else very fast even when you do get to the underground, then the Adonis constant isn't much use. Ditto in Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds. 
So it's critical that each of the HS2 stations also has good metro and other fast high capacity connections to get passengers from the HS2 stations across their respective cities and regions. Now, if all of this is done and planned with good local transport, including cycling facilities, then Henry Overman's insight comes into effect. That is, that the great centres of consumption in the Midlands and the North, with their great civic amenities, housing stocks, and other um, attributes, will also become highly competitive and collaborative centres of production, not least competitive and collaborative with London, which of course is the economic powerhouse of the nation, and the effect will indeed be a golden arrow of intense new economic activity, a single super networked metropolitan economic zone driving the whole British economy and society forward. Note also that the Golden Arrow includes Heathrow, Birmingham and Manchester airports. Heathrow and will have its connectivity further radically improved with a combination of HS2, a third runway and new rail accesses to both the west and the south uh, as these are under consideration as part of the plan for the third for the third runway, and they should definitely be included in it as part of the expansion project, which will also give Heathrow transformed connectivity with Bristol, West of England, and South Wales. So, we need to complete HS2 as fast as possible, which is 2030 if we pull all the stops out. We need HS2 stations to be integrated into their regional districts and towns through modern metro systems across London, the Midlands, and the North. And in London, this means that Crossrail 2 is critical and must open at the same time as HS2 in 2030. Crossrail 2 serves Euston, the terminus for HS2, and connects with other crucially important London transport interchanges, as well as opening up major new housing development zones north of Tottenham with rapid, high-capacity rail connectivity into central London. And, uh, by the way... Uh, my suggestion is that if, H if Crossrail 1 could and very appropriately be named the Elizabeth Line after one of the greatest uh, Britons of the 20th century, Crossrail 2 should be named the Churchill Line after the saviour of the country in the Second World War. The arc north of Oxford, Oxford, sorry, north of London, Oxford, Milton Keynes, which isn't marked on, and Cambridge, is a crucial part of this golden arrow. The proposed new east-west rail line linking Oxford, Milton Keynes and Cambridge, which the National Infrastructure Commission, which I chair, has been strongly encouraging uh, over the last two years, should produce dramatic agglomeration effects between these three highly productive cities, Oxford, Milton Keynes and, and uh, Cambridge. Milton Keynes has an ambition to be a city of more than half a million by 2050, and would then be one of the most important centres of production in the country. Uh, whether it's uh, such a good centre of consumption, I leave to others to debate, but it's becoming clearly steadily better. But they're also, they, they are also, Oxford and Cambridge and Milton Keynes, less than an hour both from London and very close to the Midlands and via HS2 to the north. So their economic and intellectual vitality will spread north as well as south and help power the whole of the Golden Arrow and he indeed helped to make it golden. <clears throat> There's another reason why the Golden Arrow is so golden. It will give Britain the most highly networked agglomeration of major cities close to each other of any country in the world. Look at these maps I'm about to show you. Those are the five largest cities of the United States, separated New York, Philadelphia, Houston, Los Angeles, Chicago, separated by several thousand miles, and to get from Los Angeles to New York involving a plane flight of more than six hours, including navigating some of the most congested and least well-functioning airports in the world. That, uh, those are the uh, five largest cities of China, Guangzhou, Hang, Hang, Hangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, and Chongqing, um, with a, a, a somewhat smaller footprint, but still vast, to connect between them. Those are the five largest cities of Japan, Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagoya, Osaka, and Sapporo. Uh, and uh, though 
it's a slightly misleading because you've got one very significant outlier. But even if you take the others, the distance between Tokyo and Osaka, which is probably at the moment the single most economically uh, successful uh, corridor, urban corridor in the world, but that distance is still greater than London to Manchester. It's nearly the distance of, of London to Glasgow. Those are the five largest cities of Germany, Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, Frankfurt, and Munich. Um, a, a larger footprint um, than, uh, than the Japanese five, substantially smaller, of course, than China, but still very large. Those are the five largest cities of France, Paris, Toulouse, Marseille, Nice, Lyon, about the same footprint as the five largest in, in, um, in Germany. All of the countries I've just shown you, the five largest cities are substantially more than an hour apart between all, all five. In the case of, um, of, um, of the United States, thousands of miles apart and more than six hours. But in the case of all of the others, nearer two hours and in some cases three. However, the five largest cities in England under HS2, London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds, have by far, by far, the smallest footprint of all, and is the only one of the five where you get connectivity of less than an hour. So the future is indeed golden if we seize this opportunity, and uh, I believe that the moment is there for us to do so now. And one final comment. Brexit or no Brexit, Britain needs a plan. The golden arrow is a plan. It can and must be done in 2030. There was once a dream that was Rome. Ours, I hope, is a dream that will be London. Thank you very much. Well, wow. <laughs> um, at a time when uh, I, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking that uh, we're not entirely blessed with a great deal of uh, political leadership nor vision, um, I think you're very important. We have time for four questions. Uh, can I see some hands? Uh, I'd like name and institution and can you make them pithy? Thanks very much. Who's first? Down the front right here. It's coming, it's coming. Thank you. Uh, Matt Ross from Global Government Forum. Um, that's fascinating on the physical connectivity, uh, but obviously with communications, digital uh, connectivity is just as important. So I wondered about your perspective on where London stands, how its digital connectivity compares to other countries and how crucial that that is to London's future. Well, it's not nearly good enough, is the answer. On, uh, on all assessments, we have less good um, broadband and mobile um, connectivity than, um, than, than all the leading countries in terms of digital connectivity, and, and very, very substantially worse than South Korea, which is the, is, is, is the model. My own view as to why is that, um, is that our regulators haven't placed a high enough premium on investment in infrastructure with, um, with uh, new digital systems. Um, I chair the National Infrastructure Commission, which is going to have a lot more to say about this in the coming months. I probably ought to choose my words with care. But let me say I'm engaging closely and constructively with Ofcom in how we might address that, because it's not good enough for Britain to be a first world country with a less than uh, state of the art uh, digital connectivity. And we need um, uh, broad, super fast and, and thereafter ultra fast broadband to be world leading which I think probably in most cases means fibre uh, right to the premises, which we don't have for the most part at the moment. And we need 4G coverage to be acceptable, where it's, at the moment it's totally unacceptable, even on Ofcom's own figures it's unacceptable. It's barely 70% penetration. And that, that is far, far lower than it should be. I think we ought to expect now in 2017 that, um, that uh, 
4G coverage should be near universal. I mean, there's a debate about some of the most remote rural areas, but it should be near universal. And uh, there should be a sufficiently dense infrastructure to mean that calls aren't dropped. And it is absolutely extraordinary that on the railways, which after all the main means of communication between our major cities by business travellers, it is not possible to travel more than about three consecutive miles without calls being dropped. And indeed, not even to get any connectivity at all on the London Underground. And uh, though I'm in, in, uh, in, in high praise of the three mayors of London, the one ball I think the three of them together have dropped is not ensuring good enough mobile connectivity on the London Underground. And uh, I hope that that will be sorted out soon. We cannot afford to be uh, less than outstanding in terms of global rankings in digital infrastructure and uh, my commission the national infrastructure commission has a job to see that that's the standard that we reach it doesn't actually involve much public spending because of course almost all of the um, the digital providers are private sector companies and uh, though i love the private sector greatly it doesn't always invest more than it thinks it can get away with and i think the regulators need to be much tougher on the private sector in seeing that investment is put in place including open reach which has clearly been far too close to bt in the past and i think there's still a very big debate about whether the independence that it's got from bt at the moment is sufficient and whether it should actually be constituted as a completely separate company that has no conflict of interest at all between the service provider but is a straightforward infrastructure provider and regards its job as to provide state-of-the-art infrastructure on behalf of the public jeremy corbyn has one or two things to say about that and let me just say very clearly to bt and openreach if they don't get their act together sufficiently to provide state-of-the-art broadband coverage in the private sector then they sh shouldn't be surprised that many people start saying that these services are better provided in the public sector does that give you a clear enough answer to your question it, it does but it begs another question and unfortunately john's left me in control of the microphone <laughs> so the um are you not concerned that better digital connectivity would make your physical connectivity less important no. and less valuable. No, all of the evidence is, is that trade and business begets trade and business. Often. The better our digital coverage, the more vibrant our economy will be, and therefore all of the evidence is, is the more people want to travel too. So I make this prediction. If you got fibre to the premises, if you got 5G in advance of any other country in the world, which we should do, as the Japanese are already stealing a march on us with 5G, you will have a greater demand for transport connectivity, not a lesser demand. And we should regard that as a good thing because travel in the pursuit of trade, business, and maintaining good human relation, relationships is a great thing for society and only the killjoys and those who basically don't much like the human race think it's a bad thing and try to stop it. So I'm unscripted okay. at the moment. I've got, I've got a question <laughs> right the back. Oh, well, not quite at the back, but yes, yes, yes. Hi, I'm Alice. I'm a final year political economy student at King's College. Um, my question is about how much security or what kind of promises can you give to businesses, um, particularly those you're speaking of in Canary Wharf in London, ahead of a Brexit deal? If I you think it'll go ahead. Yeah. I can give absolutely no security to them whatsoever. Um, the, their, their fate is in the hands of, of the government at the moment. The government doesn't have the faintest clue what the situation is going to be. I and mean, by its own admission, it hasn't even started negotiating. The, uh, the terms on which we're going to leave the, uh, the European Union. So I can't give any security to them. I can, however, tell them that London is a fantastic place to do business. It's an extraordinarily resilient city, and provided those people responsible for policy in London do their absolute best to make London competitive and attractive, I think it will take a long time, even with disastrous national policy, for it to be worthwhile for major companies and organisations to, to leave. Um, though I uh, uh, had a, uh, a, a one or two aside remarks about Nelson's column um, moving to, uh, to somewhere uh, across the channel, um, anyone who thinks that it's a great idea to set up companies in France needs to start understanding how French labour laws work at the moment and all those massive other impediments to trade which our Gallic friends managed to impose on the belief that uh, too much work is a bad thing. And, uh, I think it will take a really serious set of massive misjudgments on the part of the government in terms of negotiating trade treaties to make London an unattractive place to do business. However, the job of the government shouldn't be to put obstacles in the way of people doing trade and business. It should be to help them. The European Union has been a brilliant help to people doing trade and business over the last generation because of the customs union and the single market. In my judgment, which some may disagree with, um, generally speaking, uh, support for Brexit is in um, 
inverse relationship to levels of education. So I think, don't think there'll be many Brexiteers in the audience this evening, but there may be some. And those that there are might think that there's some, some hypothetically great advantages on us striking out on our own and seeking a trade deal with President Trump. But to my mind, the job of the government is to safeguard the trade which we've got at the moment, which should be the first duty of any government. Most of our trade is with the 27 other members of the European Union and with the 75, 75 other countries with which the European Union has preferential trade agreements. And before we get to any position of advantage from leading, leaving the European Union, we have both to negotiate a free trade treaty with the other 27, which is as good as our membership of the European Union, and then 75, 75 trade treaties with other countries, which are at least as good as the status quo. And Liam Fox has to do that with a handful of experienced international trade negotiators. So good luck to Liam. Uh, he's got a big job on his hands. We all wish him well. But assuming that he's not successful, we at least have to hope that those people responsible for the government of London do their absolute best to keep it strong, attractive, and competitive. And that means having London services working well, keeping its taxes as low as possible, building its infrastructure out as... as um, as, uh, as effectively as possible, and then crucially, with the golden arrow, linking it much more effectively in the past than in the past with the great cities of the Midlands and the North. Because unless London is much, much more effectively networked within its own country and is much less a city-state and much more a part of the country in which it's situated, then its future is not, in my judgment, going to be secure. Question down the front here, please. Toby Baxendale, entrepreneur. Um, Andrew, that's a fantastic vision. Um, on the arrow, um, I love it. The, 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 one, the one thing I'd like to add as a suggestion, I think you, you're going there with the, with the link between Oxford and Cambridge. The, it's the east-west. That's always the problem. I've owned multiple businesses and factories all and up and, up and down the country, and the biggest problem is never north-south. Mm. It's great we can get improvement north-south. It's east-west. That's the trouble, it is going across, going across the Pennines, taking one and a half hours, two hours to get across from Sheffield to Manchester. Linking, linking that northern, northern bit up, I think, is, 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 um, is something. That, that arrow needs to be a grid. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I completely agree. And you need, what essentially you need, thinking about it schematically, is three new significant east-west crossings. Crossrail, which is east-west crossing in London. You need... Oxford, Milton Keynes, Cambridge, which is the east-west crossing south of the Midlands, linking what I you know, like to think of as the brain belt, that hugely important corridor, but not stopping at either Oxford or at Cambridge, going east into, into Suffolk and, um, and Norfolk, going east from Cambridge, and west going from um, Oxford down to Didcot, Swindon, Bristol and South Wales, and that is, if you think about it, a hugely economically powerful corridor, all the way from Swansea and Cardiff in South Wales through Bristol, Swindon, Oxford, Milton Keynes, Cambridge, and then out east. This has the potential to be a massively competitive corridor with, with London and the Thames Valley, which I think is hugely to, in the national interest, of course, is much closer to the Midlands. And then, as, as you rightly said, Toby, we then need the crossrail of the north, which connects all of the great northern cities and towns, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, York, and then on to Hull and Newcastle. The distance between, the trans-Pennine distance between Leeds and Manchester is 40 miles, 40 miles. The train which connects them is called the trans Pennine Express. It takes an hour, which is almost as great an offence against the Trade Disputes Act, Trade Descriptions Act, as my own name. And it, it, and it, and it shouldn't be allowed. And the crossroad of the North will put that right, and it can't happen soon enough. And similarly, as I said in my lecture, looking at these distances, Leeds, Bradford, two hugely important cities, because of the way that the Victorians built their railway lines and incredibly built competing lines, incredibly, to Bradford and Leeds, 
from London, the connectivity between those two cities, which is, are only six miles apart, is tiny, and the number of people who, trans who commute between them in terms of jobs is about a fifth, a fifth of what it would be if it had transport connectivity as good as London. And so it's absolutely stark staring obvious that what's needed is a metro linking those two as well. So what Toby said is completely right. We need transformed east-west connections as well as north-south. And all that is part of the, of, the, of the golden arrow. Now, the reason, by the way, I stumbled on my, uh, in, my, in, 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 in the lecture is there was a, 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 a typo which I didn't spot, which had the golden arrow as the golden triangle. We all have, including myself, even when I proofread this lecture three times, so embedded in our minds that the only thing that's golden about the connectivity of London is the triangle that links it with Oxford and Cambridge, that going through this mental revolution, which I'm inviting you to undertake with me, which which turns the triangle into an arrow and takes this whole, whole concept of state-of-the-art proximity connectivity bet between London, not just to Oxford and Cambridge, but on also to Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield, Derby, Nottingham and Leeds. That, I think, will change the face of the country. You remember the Yes Minister episode about the construction of the M40? That the M40 was only built so that Sir Humphrey could get up to high table for, din <laughs> for dinner on Friday in less than two hours. <laughs> Actually, now, the M40 is so congested, Sir Humphrey, if he's got any sense at all, doesn't use the M40. He gets the 335 from Marylebone <laughs> to Oxford, which takes precisely one hour and four minutes. And he'll get there for drinks as well. And indeed, if he's being very, very assiduous, he might even be able to make a seminar before dinner. But what we also need is for Sir Humphrey to be able, as a visiting fellow of Manchester University, a revolutionary idea, but, but Sir Humphrey can now do it because he can leave, leave under HS2 on the five o'clock from Old Oak Common, to be known henceforth as Brunel Interchange, and he can be in Manchester in time for dinner. He can have dinner in Manchester where he encourages all of the students at Manchester University to apply both for the civil service fast stream and for the civil service apprenticeship stream, whereas in the past these have been the preserves almost entirely of graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. And then he can also finish dinner at half past nine, get the 10 o'clock from Manchester and still be at home in his bed in Bayswater <laughs> in time to listen to the 10 o'clock news and the latest disasters of the Brexit negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we got a lot of questions to get through. I'd like to ask this man here, who is representative of a university in Manchester. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Adonis. It's Michael Taylor from Metropolis at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'd be very I, 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 I pleased to, well to, to, to welcome um, um, Sir Humphrey. Um, my, my question is two questions. One very brief, which is how do you rate six months in the performance of our directly elected Metro mayors? And the second question, if you liked all of that, will you unblock me on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're polite and not rude, as you were uh, engaging on, on Twitter. No, I've got no idea. I, don't, I have no idea <laughs> what you said. We, we, maybe we should have that conversation offline afterwards. Um, so what do I think of the Metro is I think they're a fantastic innovation. Hezo and I spent six months after the, the 2010 election <coughs> when David Cameron held um, his 11 referendums on introducing mayors into, um, into the great cities, going around campaigning for elected mayors. Uh, we did a double act across all of the major cities. And it was a huge <laughs> tragedy, in my view, that the, uh, Bristol did vote for an elected mayor, and the mayor of Bristol, did, we've had new, two mayors of Bristol. Both of them have been outstanding, and have done a hugely powerful job for Bristol, which was a city beset by hung administrations. It had seven leaders in the previous five years. I mean, a, a terrible story, whereas it's now had two really outstanding mayors. And the metro mayors are also of outstanding quality. And let's be clear what's happened. You know, in Birmingham, in the West Midlands, we've got the former, um, uh, managing director of John Lewis, who's, who's become mayor. Uh, I mean, a man of, un I mean, he actually had the next door room to me at Keyboard College Oxford, so he's a very, very good egg. But uh, <laughs> uh, this being England, this of course happens all the time. But, um, uh, but he was an outstanding, one of the, the most impressive business leaders of his generation and is now putting his talents into, into transforming the West Midlands. And I think that's fantastic. Andy Burnham was a ministerial colleague of mine. And I think it's a great sign of, uh, of the benefits of these mayors that politicians who previously had regarded the limit of their ambitions as Westminster and becoming a cabinet minister now 
think it is a better thing to do, a better thing to become the mayor of one of our great metropolises. And uh, if you agree with that and start saying that on Twitter, then I might unblock you. <laughs> <laughs> and we can become bosom friends again. But I, my, it might... They've, they've established very powerful agendas. Andy, um, Andy Street has already laid out an agenda for uh, what I, I called um, um, uh, the Midlands Hub, which is the transformed connectivity which should be had with all of the major towns and, and cities in the Midlands out from the HS2 station at Birmingham International. He has been personally encouraging the airport to relocate its terminal as part of the HS2 station and addressing the international investors with all the authority of the mayor of the West Midlands, something which had previously not happened at all. Indeed, there was nobody who could do it because there wasn't any political leader for the whole of the West Midlands. And Andy Burnham has been developing similarly ambitious plans for Greater Manchester. So I think that these are thoroughly worthwhile innovations. I cannot understand why my friends in the North East haven't done the same. There should be a metro mayor for the northeast. Tees Valley has got its act together, but my Labour friends in um, Gateshead, Newcastle, uh, County Durham and Sunderland, they need to get, get, get their act together, PDQ, and establish an elected mayor there too. And the same needs to happen in, in, Leeds, and, and, um, in Leeds and Bradford. Um, when I was transport secretary and visited Beijing and the transport Min minister of China said to me after about the 19th toast of Mao Tao, whatever this appalling drink was called, at 2 o'clock in the morning, where he was clearly <laughs> trying to get me under the table, and our ambassador said, the thing you have to do is just to look as if you're drinking each of them in turn. He said, he said that's the training they give if you're a member of the royal family. I thought, now I understand what it is that they do. But after about the, the, uh, the 20th, after about the 20th toast, he said to me, Lord Adonis, he said, whatever the Germans say they will build HS2 for, we will build it for half of the cost. Because, of course, the Chinese have the German technology, the German railway technology. And as the person on the other side of me, who was a leading British businessman in Beijing, said to me, what you have to understand is that here, R&D stands for rob and duplicate. <laughs> and I've, I've always regarded that as a prime, a prime principle of, of effective public policy, what you do is you scour the earth in search of good public policy, and then you rob and duplicate it. Now, mayors is not a particularly advanced idea. Most of the world's cities had mayors long before us. We've had a mayor in London for now for 17 years. All of that experience ought to be enough for the great civic leaders of the Midlands and the North to realize that the time has come to follow suit and introduce elected mayors. It can't happen soon enough. And I do not think it's good enough for the Midlands and the South to be complaining that the South, and in particular London, does so well out of investment and national priorities when it isn't even willing, in some cases, to put in place the political institutions and mechanisms which are surely preconditions of having a loud voice in London, in Whitehall and internationally and they just need to rob and duplicate and set up systems of government which was closely aligned and matched to London's which are hugely successful as fast as possible. Okay, I've got Richard, Richard down, down here. Uh, and Richard Mottram, uh, former permanent secretary, not from the Golden Triangle. Um, I, I had a sort of observation on an, uh, an observation and a question. Your arrow would, it seems to me, be uh, rather presentationally rather better if it pointed the other way, because the criticism of your arrow might be actually it's draining the whole country down into London. But then my second question would be, and you only really touched on this once, I think, the words roads. Um, only got mentioned in relation to Sir Humphrey going off to um, dinner at Oxford. And I don't think there was much discussion in, in your presentation, which I thought was absolutely excellent, particularly the Brexit bits, uh, about, uh, about that dimension of our transport policy. And I wonder, therefore, whether that wasn't a bit sort of London-centric, because I never travel around by road in London, but I think most of the population think about infrastructure in a rather broader way than your lecture. Uh, that, that's a perfectly fair uh, criticism, and um, I don't in any way us underestimate the importance of roads, particularly outside the southeast, where of course they're the principal means of travel, even for business travellers. And we do need to see innovation in roads. I'm fully in favour, as was the department which you led with such distinction, in, in favour of um, 
of uh, road pricing. I was in favour of it before we had 3 million signatures on the Downing Street petition. I'm in favour of it now. Its time will come and it needs to be done. And with autonomous and connected vehicles, I think that the case for it becomes stronger still and we can bring about very big reforms of our motorway system as part of it. When I was Transport Secretary, I took a big, made a big move forward on managed motorways, bringing the hard shoulder running to, to I I introduce technology onto motorways and a very significant increase in capacity. And I think that the first... Um, uh, revolutionary application of connected vehicles will be lorry platooning on motorways, which could enable the much, much more efficient, much more efficient um, uh, uh, conveyance of, uh, of goods traffic across the country, maybe overnight by massive convoys on motorways when they're not much used. And this could have two impacts. It could remove trucks from motorways during the day, which will make them much safer and much more capacity. And it may also, and this is a, 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 a more controversial concept, it may also dramatically change the argument against putting freight on rail. Because if you can carry freight, freight on rail, by the way, though it's regarded as generally green, is hugely disruptive of, of traffic movements on the railways because it moves so slowly and, uh, is, uh, and eats up so many rail paths. And if you could move freight onto the motorways in a, a really efficient and connected way, that could be transformational. The reason I concentrated, though, on, on high-speed rail is that in terms of transforming the connectivity between the cities, and in particular the business connectivity between the cities, and it's business connectivity that drives everything else in due course, it is high-speed rail that will produce a revolution. It is not further changes and improvements to our motorways. Further changes and improvements to our motorways will allow somewhat more efficient things that currently happen to continue happening, somewhat more efficient freight movements, somewhat more efficient road movements, but you are not going to get mass commuting on motorways between the major cities, nor are you going to get a transformation in the connectivity between our cities by means of motorways, whereas you could get it by this trebling of the capacity of intercity rail and the dramatic improvement in the connectivity between them, which makes it possible to move between them so much more efficiently. And what high-speed rail also does is enables you to transform metro services into each of these cities because it frees up all the capacity on the existing railway lines. So what I think it could bring about isn't just a huge transformation in intercity connectivity, but also a big movement of commuter passenger traffic from um, road to rail in all of the conurbations, including the conurbations of the Midlands and the North, because it will completely redraw the railway map of Britain. So roads are going to be important. Intercity roads will still have an important role to play in the next generation, but I don't believe that they're where the next transport and social revolution is going to come from. The transport and social revolution will come from high-speed rail, and let me um, immediately say that this arrow points both ways. It points to London and it points to the Midlands and the North. And I think that the transformation that we get will be both ways. It's not just going to be one way. And to those people who say everything is sucked into London, which of course is a ludicrous argument, if that were true, then what we should do is to destroy all the motorways and, road and railways that currently link London uh, with the Midlands and the North, because presumably if high-speed rail is such a bad idea and we're going to thrive by having worse connections, then the worse the better. And uh, severing the existing ones would be a big move of progress, which I don't think anybody in their right mind would think a good thing. Right, I'm sorry, we've got one last question, and I think over, over, over the side there. I, I am sorry, I'm sorry. Hello, my name is David Goodhart. I'm a critical friend of Andrew's. Um, really picking up actually on the last question, Andrew, uh, a lot of people I think would regard one of the subterranean reasons for the Brexit vote, a kind of revenge on London. And I think if I had been one of the majority of people who voted in the referendum, who voted for Brexit, if I'd been here tonight, I would not have considered you in any way admonished by that vote or responding to it in a creative way. Um, you, you, you didn't answer the implicit point about over-domination of London in our system. We're a complete outlier in Europe and indeed in the, pretty much in the whole world in the, the over-domination of one major city. And you haven't explained how your, your train set arrow is going to do anything about that. I mean, Germany has no London, it has no global universities, and it is the economic powerhouse of Europe. 
But all I can say is, is uh, and David and I, he is absolutely right that we're critical friends, but uh, he, he always, in our discussions, places more emphasis on the word critical. <laughs> uh, which is why we get on, uh, why we get on so well. Um, be very, very careful what you wish for. To my mind, one of the prime principles of public policy when you're dealing with a large country like Britain is there's lots that doesn't work. There's lots that doesn't work. And you've put your finger on a lot that doesn't work in this country. Do not start by destroying what does work. The idea that the salvation of the Midlands and the North lies in doing down London would be to repeat all of the mistakes of Abercrombie, um, what was called decongestion and attempting by government fiat to move businesses and jobs away from London that failed catastrophically in the 1960s and 70s and would fail catastrophically again. The only effect of doing down London would be an even poorer Midlands and the North. And what we've got to do is to grapple honestly, honestly with the challenges that face the country, not dealing in either sound bites or in lies and... Um, you, David, never deal in lies, and uh, uh, being an FT journalist, you never deal in sound bites either. I, I think everyone in the Midlands and North should read your book and they, would, uh, and they would profit from it. But what we have failed to do, and we, that does include a large number of the people in this room, what we failed to do is to get the right policy in place for seeing that the Midlands and the North is more successful. And part of the right policy is seeing that we connect up the country far better than in the past, and we aren't 60 years behind state-of-the-art connectivity between our major cities in the future as we have been in the past. High-speed rail linking up intercity conurbations was launched by the Japanese, the Japanese in 1964, for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. It transformed the economics and the society of that great corridor. Only, let's be clear, 20 years after the almost complete destruction of Japan, that Tokyo-Nagoya-Osaka corridor, in the course of about 10 years, became one of the greatest powerhouses in the country, thanks to the bullet trains. What was our response to the bullet trains? That you can't build straight railway lines in Britain. It's not possible to build them because of our planning system. This was the view in the 1960s, which was... I mean, anyone with a sense of history was exactly the same argument, exactly the same argument used by Sir Leslie Hall Belisha, now only remembered for a flashing light on the roads, when he was transport minister in 1936 who rejected plans from his officials for a motorway system in Britain on the grounds that the roads would be straight and therefore un-English and an instrument of fascism. The right thing in 1936 was to build motorways. The right thing in 1964 was to build high-speed rail. The fact that we got it wrong on both of those occasions is not a good excuse for continuing to get it wrong decade after decade. It may even be a reason for us in England to think that when most of the rest of the developed world does something, it might be a good idea for us to follow suit, rather than thinking that we are wholly exceptional and should be refusing to follow good international policy in exactly the same way as we're leaving the European Union. <laughs> Um, well, I, I keep saying well. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to those who had their hands up. I'm sure Andrew will take questions over drinks. Um, me, myself, I didn't get to ask the question, you know, you mentioned North, South and West London. Where was the East? Where are those crossings? I mean, it's difficult for me to get home of a weekend, I tell you. Um, well, do, you do you want me to carry on for another half hour? I can. Well, well yeah, yeah, exactly. But maybe I'll exactly. over drink. <laughs> um, our next event comes f uh, uh, fast and furious next Monday evening when Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and another visiting professor, Sir Dave Ramsden, uh, will give his inaugural lecture as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. We do have some seats still available for that. Um, and all that's left for me to say is a very big thank you to the Corporation of London for hosting this fantastic lecture uh, in what is just a remarkable room. Um, I think that was a landmark lecture, and it is my pride, it is the Strand Group's pride and King's College pride to call you our visiting professor. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.